the biggest, I suppose, problem that you had was the cervical check problem before COVID. And um, that ar- arose because audits were being done on the results of people uh, who had been diagnosed with cervical cancer and whether or not that cancer might have been detected earlier. Uh, and I know in the discussions on this programme, we talked about the lack of clarity that screening is not diagnosis. Screening is about the bigger population and mistakes will happen. But could some of those mistakes have been avoided in, you know, by not uh, outsourcing cytology, for example, by doing it locally or... Is it the name of the game that these things happen statistically? Well, you've described it accurately. And there's so few people who really have good grasp in the way that you've just articulated what happened here. The retrospective audit was conducted on people who'd already had a diagnosis of cancer. The purpose of it was to see, was there an opportunity missed in the course of that person's treatment to have picked up earlier uh, or, or to have done something differently? And the purpose of that was to educate and improve the standards so that for people coming into the programme in the future, that there was a greater chance of things working. The reality is the test that's at at issue here, which is the pap smear, was a good test, but far from a perfect test. Uh, And it was a screening test and it was applied to a portion of people. And the way cervical screening works is it says to you as a woman, if you enter the screening programme, you have regular smears through this and those are done in accredited labs, as was the case in this country. The, the, The outsourced labs... Uh, and there's been a lot of controversy about those, did not fail in terms of the actual standards that were applied. Uh, um, We wouldn't have been able to start a screening programme because we did not have the laboratories in this country to do the scale of screening that had to be done. We were able to start a screening programme in 2008. Mary Harney was able to get the resources from government at the time when, as you you recall, we we were broke. And we had no money, and yet money was found to start this programme. Mm. And a big part of that was because Grony Flannelly, who was the clinical director, had made a huge impression on all of us, including the minister. Having come back from the UK where she had trained, she talked about her shock at seeing young women with late presentations of cervical cancer with young families finding themselves facing a terminal diagnosis. Mm. And this was, uh, this, this was a complete difference to her experience yeah. where she trained in the UK. Now, uh, the, I, I suppose the, the cat got out of the bag because there had been a commitment to tell people who were being audited that, you know, about the, their results. Yes. Um, but some f- uh, clinicians didn't agree with that and didn't do it, actually. That's correct. Um, and this was a problem. But there had been a commitment from Cervical Check that this would happen and that didn't happen. Yes. And that's at the core of it. And there was clearly a commitment uh, uh, made and women understood that they would receive that information and then they didn't. And, and, and that was at the heart, if you like, of the breach of trust. Uh, and there probably wasn't a strong enough system to determine centrally at cervical check that the, the information that they provided to the clinicians and that they expected to be passed on to the patients was in fact passed but on. But wasn't it, it about um, explaining to them maybe that they had been missed, but it wouldn't have changed the course of their treatment? Correct. It was about t- and, and for many of the clinicians, it was an understandable concern because you could be talking about individuals with early stage cancer that was effectively treated many years previously and now they were getting a result that they were expected to, 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 to give back to a patient that would have had made, made no material difference. And in a lot of situations might have actually caused a lot of upset and concern on the part of those patients, which is one of the reasons why many other countries do not, not only do they not do this, they have laws that prevent yeah. the sharing of this information. Now, countries like the Netherlands and Canada. When you shared this with the then Minister for Health, Simon Harris, uh, he jumped the gun. He decided, I'm announcing, whether you like it or not, an HSE inquiry. And you're critical of them for that. So a HSE inquiry was announced and that didn't ultimately take place. I mean, within 24 hours, it was very clear that that was not adequate. Did you try to stop him saying, hang on a second, let's let's do the investigation? And some people have inferred that that was me trying to stop the Scali inquiry because I didn't want the screening programme investigated. Quite the opposite. What I wanted to do was to ensure that we understood what it was we were investigating. And so we spent that full weekend in the screening programme offices and over the course of the work that we did, engaging with hospitals around the country by Sunday of that weekend. This is, I'm talking about a Friday to Sunday. We established that somewhere in the region of 200 people uh, who who should have had uh, uh, results fed back to them, three quarters of them had not. And that was the first time that knowledge was assembled. And now we had a clear basis. And where does the blame for that lie? I mean, was it a cervical check? I mean, you say that Gronia Flannelly was treated very badly. She had to resign. Yes. Um, But was it uh, at her door that... 
that lack of communication has to be laid. Like the way I'd like to look at it personally would be that like we had a really good screening programme. There were faults, of course, with it. Uh, Gabriel Scali has done an excellent report which has identified a number of the improvements that have now been made. Uh, uh, that screening programme sought to introduce another layer of improvement, which was the, the audit and then the feeding back of that information. Arguably, it wasn't done as well as it could have been. It could have been planned for better. There could have been clear buy-in for the clinicians before it commenced. And there should have been probably a, a, an audit loop that the centre was able to tell that the information had in fact been given back. So results were being posted out to clinicians and then not being fed back to the women. And the centre had no way of knowing that that was the case. And that was really at issue. And it was only on that Sunday afternoon, the work that we did over the course of that weekend, the team that I led that we went up, uh, that went up to the screening programme offices, assemble that information for the first time. And now we had a basis for the scale of investigation that ultimately became now, the Scali There report. were so many campaigners, including the late Vicky Phelan, uh, about all of this. Um, would anything that you, uh, that was done, if you like, by cervical check have changed the course of her illness? Uh, I, I, I'm not privy to the details of Vicky's illness uh, and, and, and her clinical management. But in the main, for people who are through the programme, this was not about information or finding information for the purpose of change in the clinical course of their individual illness. It was about trying to identify, that's the purpose of the audit, identify whether opportunities to improve the programme could be taken yeah. that would make it better for women in the future. Now the programme is better now because the test is, it, that is used uh, for the, the, the smears is, is uh, different. Um, and it's also better, if, if, forgive me Pat, uh, because we now also have HPV immunisation. We've been immunising young girls and now young boys for, for, for over 10 years or almost 10 years uh, with HPV vaccines. So we have two really effective, so we have HPV vaccination and HPV screening and we're well on the way to effectively eliminating cervical cancer, the only cancer we can actually say this about. So we're really in a strong position now in this country compared yeah. to where we were. Do you think, though, that the public is any better uh, aware of the fact that, you know, what screening is versus diagnosis? Because that's a key. It should have been writ large on every form, be it breast check or cervical check or whatever check we might introduce. It should be writ large. This is not a diagnosis. This is screening. This is a public health measure, not a not a personal individual measure. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, um, I, I'm not confident that the public understands this a lot better. There are many parts of the medical profession where this is not well understood. Uh, the materials that have been produced by the Cancer Screening Service, second to none on a global scale in, in terms of how they explain this. And anybody who's interested in reading further into this, the writings of Daniel Murray in the Sunday Business Post are exemplary in terms of detailed understanding of the nature of this. Anybody who wants to an authoritative account of this, uh, that's the place to go.